We have a pretty ambitious agenda for tonight, and so we want to make sure that there is plenty of time for discussion this week. So um, we just wanted to get started in, uh, first by saying um, welcome. Thank you all for coming. Thank you to those who returned from last week. Thank you to all the newcomers. This is a repeat of the first meeting. Um, we are going to um, breeze through our presentations again so that we have time for our discussion. But um, we wanted to first do introductions and um, just let everybody know that um, several departments and um, some um, executive leadership and community members have been meeting since the summertime to um, start talking about the possibility, um, what it would look like if we develop a tribal education system here um, in our community. And so we thought a good first step would to hold, be to hold community meetings to gather input from the community um, to make sure that um, you know we are doing things in a way that is being led by community needs and um, ensure that um, there is a need and a want for a tribal school. So that's the purpose of the meeting. Um, to my right are some folks that have been um, a part of the planning. So um, I'm going to go ahead and pass the mic to everybody. Did I introduce myself yet? No. No? Okay. <laughs> my bad. Um, Janan Dijnikaz, and she came to them. Um, Baganak Singh Odawa, Kwei Ndao, Education Director in Donangje. Um, my name is Janan Koto. I'm the Education Director. I have been with the tribe as the Education Director for about five and a half years. And um, it's great to see everybody. Thank you. Hey, you much. Dorothy and Dijnikaz, Baganak Odawa Ndao, Mishiki and Doda, um, Wetsiriba. I am working here, I work in the Education Department as an Academic Services Coordinator, and I'm just now starting my 16th year working in this good place. Thank you. Good. Hey, I'm Amanda Weiner, Tifima, Washington, Mobile, Kuwait, Nishna Kaz, Urban Peninsula, Dota, Rafa, Dota, Ojibwe, Mima, Rawa, and Dao. I work in the Education Department as a curriculum specialist, and this is my second year. And I'm not good at talking to my phones. 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 Uh, I guess that's it. Uh, much. Um, I'm Phil Hyman. I'm the Direct Services Administrator um, for the Executive Branch, and we'll be helping out with the exercise tonight. So that's the fun. Ani Ibuju, Menobu Mose Queen, the goal, Miki Zen Dodam, Simo Dawa, and Nodi Ben Dawa. Oh, it's very sad. We're doing so good. Yeah, it's great. Start on the road. Uh, I am the, I work for the language department. I'm language instructor for high schools, Pekoski and Harbor Springs, teaching Anishinaabe Lewin uh, beginning and intermediate levels and uh, develop curriculum. Which. All right, we've got your buddy for the introductions. Okay, we're just going to go ahead and get started with the presentation and slideshow. I'm going to try to end mine right at six. So I'm going to breeze through. If you guys do have questions about anything um, that I present as part of my slideshow, please um, let me know afterwards. Um, I hope that we have some time for discussion and Q&A um, after we go through the exercise a little bit. Okay, so um, I'm going to start us off by talking about um, TBB, our community, our education department, and um, some of the needs that we have seen <coughs> um, over the past five and a half years or so since I've been here, um, the initiatives and programs that we've taken out and we've implemented, some of the foundational philosophies that have informed those, and um, the successes we've seen. Okay, so um, I'm going to quickly go over the needs assessment that uh, the Education Department conducted in early 2013. So um, 
this was a needs assessment that covered all of the education department programs. Um, it was sent to all citizens, 18 and older. There were 623 respondents representing about 10% response rate. We asked a total of 187 questions, quite a bit, but not all had to be answered um, based on um, you know, how you answered previous questions. So we had some skip logic built in. Okay, so I just wanted to share some of the results of that. So um, the first question, and by the way, this is a copy of this section uh, is included in your packets. So the first uh, question is, do you think learning styles are influenced by culture? 77.4% responded yes. Okay. Uh, the second question is, do you think a tribally operated school will help preserve and protect our right to an education? 70% responded yes. The next question is, do you think a tribally operated school should do the work of preserving our Anishinaabe heritage while helping helping students adapt to the present world? 85.6% of the uh, people that answered responded yes. And the next question is, do you believe there are benefits of speaking two or more languages? 96.7% of the people who responded answered yes. And uh, do you believe a tribally operated school should provide Anishinaabe and language immersion education? 86.1% responded yes. And um, this question here could have been worded a little bit better. I think that um, you know, if I were to send something like this out again, I would instead of um, saying offer a boarding school option, I would reword that and. Um, uh, use the term dormitory option or dorms, um, on-site living, something like that. So should a tribally operated school offer a boarding option for out-of-area tribal children? 45.1% said yes. Um, and I suspect that number would be higher. Um, I think that when people see the term boarding and school, they start to, um, you know, kind of tense up a little bit because, of course, that um, lots of our family members have had bad experiences going in schools. So. Okay, and I wanted to share this um, last slide here. We asked what would be the ideal location for a tribally operated school? 42.1% responded Petoskey and 27.1% responded the government complex. Okay, so um, the next bit that I wanted to share was um, some data and information that we gathered through a series of early childhood focused community input meetings that were held in early 2013. We held four in total. Um, they were held in January through March. And this was part of a project um, that uh, we received some um, sub-grant funding for from Intertribal Council. They received a large grant from the Kellogg Foundation to take a look at um, needs as related to early childhood across the state, across tribal communities. Um, so we identified themes and priorities for our community and um, so did the other communities that participated in this project with ITC looking at early childhood needs. Okay, so um, this is what emerged as some of the major assumptions and implications based on these community meetings, the qualitative data that was collected, and how it was um, analyzed through um, a program called In Vivo 10 that a lot of um, social scientist researchers and universities use to analyze qualitative data. So um, the first is parents do the best they can with what they have. Parents don't engage because they face barriers. The second is a barrier to systems change and long-range planning is the turnover in the elected leadership, including tribal council, chair, and vice chair. The third is community isn't informed about community, family, and cultural events. The fourth is poor nutrition is encouraged by systems, um, like the WIC program, USDA, and by pricing. So government subsidies, um, you know, making the cost of certain kinds of foods that aren't necessarily great for us a lot cheaper. Um, the top areas of concern that emerge from the data 
um, which included lack of healthy role models, poor nutrition, family engagement, culture and identity, adult supervision, and education on important health and education issues are related to parent skills, knowledge, and motivation. And then lastly, cultural identity is critical in the development of healthy children. So next, I wanted to share some questions to consider um, with um, all of this data that we looked at. Um, these questions emerged for us. So the first was, how will our strategies address barriers for parents? What can we do to make it easier for people to eat whole foods? Who should be teaching? Who should we be teaching culture to? Parents or children? And finally, how does transmission of culture happen outside of the government structure? Okay, now I'm going to um, quickly in the next five minutes talk about our programs and initiatives, um, including our approaches to decolonizing education and um, how we assert our educational sovereignty. Um, so just to give us um, you know, some information to start from, um, I know a lot of you know this, but um, for nearly 150 years, the education of our children was our, out of our direct control um, and education happened to us. This was an intentional erase and replace strategy. The curriculum was designed to assimilate tribal children into the dominant culture. Um, the community identities of tribal children weren't honored, they weren't supported. Um, so the question that um, comes out of this is, what have been the long-term implications on identity, self-esteem, life success of individuals, and well-being of our tribal families and communities? Um, so in thinking about and considering this question, um, we definitely recognize that there is a need for healing um, from the trauma of the boarding schools. And, um, you know, we recognize that because education has been used as a strategy for assimilation. It could also be used as a strategy for undoing the doings of forced assimilation through education. Um, I wanted to share some quotes um, from some uh, researchers in, in uh, Native education um, that will kind of um, frame you know, how, how we think about how the education system has served us and is currently serving us. So Pei Wardy and Hammer noted a serious concern over the lack of success of many ethnic um, and racial minority students despite years of educational reform. And uh, researcher um, Dr. Bing said cultural overlays or cultural connections is probably not enough to change the experience of the majority of our children in schools. And so what she means by cultural overlays or cultural connections is um, really utilizing a curriculum that privileges Western thought, Western idea, Western histories, Western um, heroes and leaders, and just simply peppering in you know, a Native American Heritage Day event here, you know, a speaker there. She's saying that that's probably not enough to change the school experience um, for our tribal children. Okay, so uh, again, th there have been changes, but um, public schools still remain places where community identities of tribal children are not honored and supported. Um, examples include some really obvious or overt omissions of tribal people and per perspectives from history, social studies, and then we have examples of more subtle undermining of tribal perspectives in spaces like science classrooms. So the last time I shared an example of um, a science lesson that is uh, directly connected to um, the standards for our first graders. So in first grade, one of the first science lessons that you have is living versus non-living. And in science classrooms in our public schools, our six-year-old little little ones are learning that what they have learned in the community about water having spirit, having life, and rocks having spirit, having life is wrong. So this is some of the earliest school experiences that our kids are having. Um, their identities are being undermined. So, um, the cycle continues, unfortunately. So, um, just going back to um, some of those needs um, that we shared um, that we 
uncovered through those assessments and some of those community conversations. Um, community voice to need to return to our educational traditions and create places and spaces where our children can learn in ways that recognize their tribal identities, integrate them into curriculum in ways that build off of their strengths as tribal children. Okay, so I'm going to quickly go through the rest of the slides to tell you about um, our programs and some successes. So um, first I wanted to share this quote. This came from um, the uh, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous Peoples. Um, and it says, Indigenous peoples have the right to establish and control their own educational systems and institutions providing education in their own languages in a manner appropriate to their cultural methods of teaching and learning. So, you know, when we develop programming here, we sort of take this idea that was developed by um, groups that Frank has been a part of and really try to apply that um, kind of thinking to the programs we develop and assert our educational sovereignty. So, um, again, we're thinking about, you know, the UN um, Declaration on the Rights of Indigenous People. So we're thinking about how we exercise our educational sovereignty in a way that kind of moves away from duplicating a lot of the harmful ways we've been educated since colonization. So decolonizing our education. So we developed um, Ishkakimkwe Kimagewunan, which is an indigenous multidisciplinary curriculum design program that um, integrates cultural and Western academic knowledge through a land-based framework. And so a lot of the times the way that we do that is instead of the cultural overlay and just adding, you know, uh, a craft to a lesson um, and making the cultural connection, we start with a cultural practice. So um, an example is with our um, the May teachings, which is a fish in the classroom program. Um, they start by learning the clan system and learning about the sturgeon as a clan animal. And that's their first lesson. Um, so I, I think I'm gonna skip this quote and skip this next section. Um, so these are some of the things that we do through this program. We provide curriculum to support to educators in four school districts in the Sharm ISD. It meets content standards. It, um, we do this through a land-based education framework. The instruction is locally relevant. Um, we try to incorporate hands-on experiences as often as possible. Um, and uh, students examine phenomena from multiple perspectives, so both Odawa, Anishinaabe, and Western. And these are our goals. We want to increase resources for teachers, um, expand opportunities for learners of all backgrounds to engage with content from multiple perspectives and improve, thereby improving the experience of both tribal and non-tribal students. Um, we want to shift long-standing historical practices that have omitted indigenous people from decision-making power over education. So by doing this, we um, are directly involved in um, the production and direction of the curriculum that gets taught. And then um, we want to increase the representations of our people, our community, our language, stories, and perspectives in the classroom and in ways that are effective and appropriate. Here are some of the products that we um, produce. So lesson plans, units, curricular enhancements. So if teachers are already doing something, but they really want to make it better, we help them out with that. Um, some professional development and coaching on how to better do um, this kind of work and evaluation of materials. So um, I did mention NAME teachings. This is one of our most successful programs. Um, and I'll just share a few important points about it. You wanna um, show the next slide? Okay. Um, so we piloted this in the Pelson ninth grade biology classroom in 2014-15. We have um, expanded to four classrooms and in one school year we have reached up to 360 to 370 tribal and non-tribal students. And um, basically they get a sturgeon um, and a tank provided by NRD so we partner with them on this and then um, all of the lessons are aligned with the standards and um, they uh, emphasize experiential learning, critical thinking, and field methodology. And I'll just share some of the, we can skip these, some of the outcomes of this. Okay, so um, 
you know, I did want to point out this last bullet here. This is this whole presentation is in your packet. Um, again, if you have questions, please let me know. But um, the students in all the districts complete a pre and post assessment. So the post test average demonstrates an increase of 19 percentage point. This is based on our, our most recent data. So that's a pretty big jump. Um, and the most significant increases were in knowledge and understanding around the tribal perspective on reciprocal relationships with the Nime or Lake Sturgeon, understanding of dams and fish, fish passages, and practices in tribal fisheries. And um, I will just quickly cover, this is um, some summer programming that we do, so we don't have a tribal school, so you know, when we try to uh, exercise our educational sovereignty, we do it in this way, you know, offering um, kind of science land-based um, programming over the summer. One year we studied food and health, our medicines, multiple perspectives on water, and being in the circle. I will just quickly go over a few of the activities and then I'm going to wrap it up and let Nate talk because she's got a fantastic presentation for you guys. So some of the things that we have done um, or learn about treaty and fishing rights, we have, um, we actually started uh, this year um, that I'm talking about in particular with a tour um, that was guided by Yvonne Walker-Kijik where kids just got to see their homelands from a completely new perspective. So instead of like, well that's where I go to school, and that's where we do our laundry, and that's where we go to church, they were learning about the traditional stories of this place. So that's where we started, them getting to know their land, uh, traditional homelands. Um, edible plant ID, we made um, a decolonized meal with um, foods that you traditionally would have found here before colonization. Um, they learned medicinal plant ID and harvesting, teachings around how to do that appropriately, respectfully. They made medicines like teas and salves, um, and they used GIS technology to map those medicines. Um, here in our land base, they did water ceremony, got water teachings, and things like that. Um, and they did a community service project. They made a rain garden to give back to the community. And these are some of the outcomes. I'm going to wrap it up after this. So um, we were able to assess their knowledge uh, and how it increased, and um, it increased in all areas, but most significantly, knowledge around minimal importance of lacrosse. Um, places they can harvest medicine, medicine making great gardens. And um, I will share this really neat story and I'll wrap it up. Um, just anecdotally, we can see that their interest in medicine increased. So they would have outdoor free choice time every day after lunch. And they took that opportunity to just go play in the woods. They created this whole complex of uh, fort out there. and. They named it Lee Phil, they had mayors, they had elders, they had two medicine men and a doctor, and the complex had a bank, a mayor's throne, a clinic, and a room where medicines were made. So this is the kind of stuff that we're doing and we're trying to teach kids. Um, here's some more pictures. Jimmy Butch, thank you for listening. Any would you? I introduced uh, myself earlier. Uh, my name is Nathan Kyogma. My Anishinaabe name is Minoko Mosekwe. Um, from the Eagle Clan, because they know them. Uh, so what I'm going to do is, uh, so Janan talked about the numbers and some of the curriculum, so I'm going to talk about the um, native student profiles. So these are students from that I've worked with, some are my class, some are you know, youth in the community or even other native communities that I've worked with. Um, so just to talk real quick about um, Self-introduction and then native student profiles and then brain goals. I'll get into that a little later. Um, and then the ideal whole uh, healthy student, healthy native student. Um, and then uh, thoughts from directly from our youth. And so I'm Ikina. Uh, that's my lovely bunch right there. Um, I have a, a teaching degree from CMU in uh, language arts. I'm currently in a uh, master's program in curriculum and instruction, and I have an Ojibwe teaching diploma from uh, Bay Mills Community College. Uh, and I currently teach, oh, I'm not staying still enough, I gotta, I, I was really trying to watch Janan, I was like, how is she doing that? So I have to be a little more still, I guess. Um, and right now I'm in both high schools, and Petoskey I'm in the mornings, and I have a beginning and then an intermediate hour, and then in the afternoons I go to the harbor, and then we have uh, three levels, 
in one classroom. Uh, and our student teacher, Anuman uh, Shinovsky, is teaching the beginning class, and then I have the other two levels, so you know we're all in this like open classroom with three different levels. Um, it's pretty cool, you hear a lot of language, a lot of language going on, a lot of activities, so. Um, so what I did was I developed these student types, these student profiles. It's all anonymous, of course, and but the, the factors are real. So these students are made up, but the factors are real. Um, so let's start with student type basic, um, age 14. Uh, he or she has a learning disability. A lot of our native youth have learning disabilities in the school. Uh, adopted by grandparents. Both parents have a severe alcoholism and they're in and out of rehab. Um, low, middle to low income households. And this youth feels bored, no sense of belonging. Uh, student type niche is 16, uh, raised by a single parent. The single parent works a lot of hours. Uh, we have, uh, the student has many younger siblings that he or she is responsible for. Uh, parent is strict, drug and alcohol free, household but you know, provider, so constantly working long hours. Uh, the parent, uh, oh the student, wants to go to college but there's no self-esteem, there's uh, not a real support system there. Um, relationship pressure, so the hours where teenagers get into things that they're too young to experience is usually after school because the parents are working. Um, and interested in tribal background, but the parent is just too busy, you know, to help. So again, that support system that our students really need sometimes just is not there. And it's not the parent's fault. And then we have a native student type in this way. Um, age 17, both parents at home, uh, college educated. Uh, they have high to medium salaries. Student is an athlete in a band, so the student is doing very well, it seems like. A uh, native parent was adopted by a non-native family. It was very little of real family and tribe. Uh, the student is not really encouraged to learn about native background and knows very little. So again, these are you know some of the cases that, that I do encounter. So it's really hard um, if that student doesn't have that at home. Uh, sometimes they're not going to go out and seek it. So sometimes you have Native students who know they're Native, but uh, just, just because they're, they might be afraid of it or just lack of knowledge and they don't understand the importance of it. Oh, I am. Oh, I'm sorry, was that new? I'm sorry. Sorry, I can't even count. Which other one? Um, so our, our four student profile, Niwen, uh, age 17, both parents highly involved in students' life. There's a lot of support at home. Uh, decent grades, college bound, wants to go to college, getting ready for college. And uh, hears language and songs with family. So Anishinaabe songs, hears some language at home, maybe with grandparents. Uh, often goes to ceremonies with their family. And then here's something that's, that's really different, is the community and the family held rites of passage ceremony when puberty phase happened. So this is a community celebrating that young boy becoming a man, that young woman, that young girl becoming a woman, and that solidifies who they are. You're, you're telling them and you're showing them you are important and you are a part of this community and this is how you come into that, this welcome to you know, manhood, welcome to womanhood. And it's a very special ceremony because, well, they feel important and they feel wanted. And if you noticed a couple of student profiles where that student didn't feel like they belong, when this happens, they belong. So they're not gonna go out there and seek it. They're not gonna go out and seek and try to fill that, fill that gap with something else, you know, which is easy. You can always fill that gap with alcohol, drugs, a boyfriend, a girlfriend. You know, it's, it's easy to find that. That's available. But things like this that are not available to our youth. And that's where, you know, that's where you see a lot of the problems. So research 
explains that when our brain goes through this, faces the world, uh, we have a working memory. So when things happen to us, when we experience things, um, and it can be good things, bad things, but right away our brain has to process that. So what happens is we have a, it's called the um, processing station, where our brain is like, okay, am I gonna store this in the short term, which means it's just gonna go in and out, or is this going to be long term, which means that stays with you forever, for life. So when trauma happens, it's, it's traumatic, it goes in our long-term memory and it affects us. When, we, when young children see things, when they go through things, this is what happens. But if you look at it in a different light, what if our children went through ceremony? What if our children learned how to use sing? What if our children had a ceremony when they hit puberty? that's going to stick in their long-term memory as well. That's going to stick with them forever, too. So that's, so when we look at the short-term, long-term, this is starting to make, become a part of them. Starting to become a part of them and it's starting to uh, make their self-identity. So as a community, what do we want to fill that with? for their self-identity, for these young adults who are future leaders, who are going to carry on all of the legacies. What, what do we want as a community for them when they experience things? So the brain goal, so short term, that's basic food and shelter. I'm hungry, I need to eat. I'm cold, I need a coat. I'm tired, I need to go home and go to bed. Those are, those are short-term needs. Um, Long-term are lifelong goals, um, athletes, music, if you're a musician, you know, those are something that you want to attain. You want to be a better athlete. Um, you want to learn how to play the drums or the guitar better, things like that. Those are, lo those are long-term, life-term. But the thing is that our, our youth, specifically our native youth, can't even get past the short-term goals because they face a lot of things at home. They face poverty, abuse, uh, hunger. They can't get past those goals. So how do we expect them to do well in school? They're not worried about grades. They're worried about who's gonna be home when I get there. They're worried about is mom or dad gonna be drunk and gonna start smacking us around? You know, that, that's a reality that our native students face. So they can't even get past that. So then we always, so then we ask the question, why do we have the highest dropout rate? You know, why, why do we have, a, our native kids just, they, they just lack interest in their academics. You know, why do we have that? Well, it's, a lot of it is because of this. They, they can't get past the short-term goals. Because they get there and it's just gonna happen, you know, repeatedly. It's just gonna keep on going. So it, it's, a, it's a cycle. The short-term goal is just a cycle and it keeps happening. And then as, as a community, we need to change that. And I think the opportunity to change that is with the tribal school. Because we have, we, for one time, we've seen it. When uh, we were doing, when Janelle was talking earlier about the Minoga Matsuin camps when we were doing that in the summer, um, we would, what we did was we walked through and showed, and there was at least 40 youth there, um, ages, six um, to teen. And what we did was we, we walked through, taught them about sim, taught them about tobacco. You know, where you hold it with your left hand. And then so we, we taught the boys that, that that's a men's role, that's what men do. So we taught the young boys how to do that. And then we walked through the whole ceremony. Uh, we taught them a prayer, the Shnabi Moen. Um, and then we taught the young girls how to do a water ceremony, and then we taught them a song. And then within two weeks, only two weeks, all of those children ran those ceremonies themselves without any adults helping. And it was, it was amazing to see that, because they, we, we showed them, we guided them, we modeled it, taught them, and they took it over. And that was theirs, that was their ceremony, 
that was a natural part of their life that happened every morning. They knew that the sun came up in uh, Wabanabakea in the eastern direction, and that's where you pray. They know to turn in that direction and pray towards the east. Uh, they they know how to they acknowledged every direction. They acknowledged all of our teachings, and I think I lost my touch here, Janelle. Oh wait, okay, it's right here. <laughs> Um, and then the girls would come and follow through with the water. They knew what to do. So within two weeks, they could do all of that. And I bet you anything, I bet you anything, they will always remember that. That is in their long-term memory. Two weeks, imagine if we had a school and we did that every day. Imagine the difference. Just those two weeks had a huge impact on that camp and those children that were involved. It had an impact on the adults, too. Uh, because we, we saw it happening before our eyes, you know, and it was just a beautiful thing. Um, that's something I wish I had, and I bet a lot of people in here wish they had that as a child, too. Um, that that would have made a huge difference in my life. So, we saw it. There's, there's proof. It works. Our culture works. So, what I did was I went around to my students, and um, high school age, grades uh, freshman to, to 12th, grade, uh, 12th grade, and I asked them, if there was a tribal school, would you want to go? What would you like to see? So I got their thoughts, and I started writing them down. Um, so in the center here, we have tribal school, and first thing that went up was culture, next was spirituality, third was language. And all three of those are intertwined, all of them. You can't have one without the other, they're all three of them together important. Um, they wanted all of their subjects, math, social studies, history, art, reading, they wanted it all in the Anishinaabe Muslim. And not just the language, I mean the history. They want to know um, history of here, the local history. Because usually they're finding out what's ha what happened in France in the 1500s, you know. Like, who cares? Why do we need to know that? We want to know what happened here in the 1500s with our people, with our ancestors. That's the kind of history they wanted. Uh, and local history. And not, usually the history they get, the native history they get, is um, in the third grade and they learn about Pueblos and Navajos. That's great and all, but how about Odawas? And Odawas, you know? That's the kind of history they need to learn from Odawa people, right? Um, art and music. Look at look around at our walls right now. You know what kind of art teachers do we have here already? You know what I mean? And who can teach all of that? Uh, music. We have drummers. We have singers. We have flute players. I mean, the, the list goes on. We can fill in every standard. That is no problem filling in the Common Core standards. I've done that. It, it, that's that's easy to do. But um, the hard part is. <laughs> the hard part is convincing our own people that this works. Convincing that this really does work and we've, we've seen it. it. It's happened before our eyes. Um, oh, and then of course, whatever the tribal school turns out to be, and I'm speaking like it's going to happen because it's, it's going to happen. Whatever it turns out to be, um, do we... At some point, we, of course, we have to teach English, you know, because we, we want because our children are going to be um, academically uh, competitive, and they and they will be. Um, but the thing is, when they brought up English, it was like what they've been taught in the Anishinaabe Mohan class is respecting both languages, so being being fluent in both languages. So. When you talk in Anishinaabe, you'll be able to translate in English better. So having respect for that, you know, that was important and they saw that. So I was really proud of them. I mean, this, this was awesome. So up here we have, it looks like a little cross um, or a T, but it's actually a plus sign with an S up there. Um, what, what were the good things about a tribal school? And the first thing they said was, I finally will not be a minority. They're tired of being the minorities in school. They're always the, you know, the, the one that sticks out, you know, trying to blend in. 
you know, the one that is not relating to a lot of people. You know, that they're tired of feeling that way. So they were glad that, okay, I finally won't be in the minority. I will be in a room, classroom of my peers and adults who support me because we're all Anishinaabe and we all believe in Anishinaabe life. Um, they said the bullying will decline and that, I thought that was big because everyone there is going to have respect for each other and they're going to learn the seven Kinawagewanan, our seven grandfather teachings. Um, explaining who you are versus stereotypes, no one's going to ask them, oh, you're a real Indian? You know, where's your, where's your feathers? Does your dad wear a, he a headdress? You know, they, they'll, they'll be more than glad to get rid of those questions. Because there at the tribal school, they don't have to explain everything because everyone knows them and everyone knows who they are. But most importantly, they know who they are as an Anishinaabe person. Uh, better academics. When they say that, they mean more inclusion of academics. Of The only time they hear about Native people is what, bearing straight theory? Yes, they still teach that in school. I can't believe it. Thanksgiving. Um, and we'll say, oh, Columbus Day, of course. And that was a big one. They were, they were like Indigenous People's Day all the way, you know. Um, quality, more knowledgeable, open-minded teachers. You wouldn't believe the disrespect they get from their high school teachers. They either just don't care or they're not interested. That's not all the teachers, of course. But the majority of them, and what I hear right from students, is that their teachers have a lack of understanding and a lack of interest in who they are. They don't even talk to them, you know. It's like they don't even care. So why would you want to learn in a classroom in a situation where the adult, the leader in the room doesn't even care about you and has no interest in you? You're not going to learn that way. So that, that I, th I was pretty impressed with that one. Um, preservation for our culture. Um, the same thing, respect. That kind of goes with the more open-minded with the teachers respecting um, each other, mutual respect. But you know, our, a lot of our Native students do get disrespected in the schools, even though there's no intention there. Maybe someone is just curious, you know, about that Native student. But a, a lot of times it is, you know, uh, mean. It, it is intentional. And then more hands-on, more active. They don't want to learn about a lodge. They want to go out there and build one. We, so that means us, we got we to learn how to build a lodge too, because that's what they want to do, you know, is because this is going to be a community school. You know, we have, we have several teachers in this room already. Um, some of the concerns was worried about fitting in. Oh, I don't really know a lot about, you know, being Anishinaabe. Will I fit in? You know, questions like that. And of course, we are like, don't worry about it. You're going you're gonna to fit in fine. Um, and then lack of interest. So there's a few students that, eh, you know, I'm getting by. You know, as long as I'm not getting bullied too bad that day, I, I, I guess I'm getting by. You know, they're okay with that. But those students also, who try to act like they were interested and try to act like everything was okay, you know, um, you could see their facial expressions and their eyes perk up when we were talking about this. So deep down inside, they do care. You know, and if they were around it, and both and, and both of the students that didn't care, um, you know, being a teacher, I know some of the background they come from, and there's not a lot of support there. Uh, there's not a lot of support of Anishinaabe identity in the households, so it does it, it makes a difference. Um, there were a few things I forgot to add that I didn't even I didn't say last week either. It was um, I go ahead and put on the pictures. Um, was that all of the students, at first they didn't agree, I thought this was really good, all of the students agreed that in the school, um, no uh, technology, as in no phones. Like they're even willing to give up their phones at the, at the doorway and go all day without their phones, without social media. You wouldn't believe the cyberbullying that goes on with Facebook and Instagram and all that stuff. It's, it's really bad. And then just the social media and them, it's a problem. Like they're becoming addicted to their phones. 
and they're texting. It's like they can't live without it. They start to have withdrawals when I had to take their phones away in the beginning of class. So imagine if they put their phones away, stayed off of all that BS, and if they were out there in the sugar bush. You know, that's what they want. They don't want to be They want to be out there. You know, they want to be out in the sugar bush. They want to be out harvesting wild rice. So they, so then they started designing the school, and this, and this is what is really, this was profound. I told them, I said, I'm sorry, but when this school is developed and when it's up and running, you won't, you'll be too old to go to it. So they're not even benefiting from this school, but you know what they said? They said, but my kids can go to this school, and that just touched my heart, like took me back. You know, I was. And that, that was an unguided question. They said that themselves. You know, so I felt bad saying that. I said, oh, we're going to build this wonderful school. But guess what? You can't go. You know, that, that was heartbreaking telling them that. But then instantly, they said, my kids can go to that school, and I can come back and work at that school. So that, that was amazing. That, that was eye-opening. That made you know my whole week when I heard our own youth say that. So they want to be a part of this. They want to help plan it, and they want to come back and work at it. And one day they want their kids to go to this school. To me, that's enough. That's enough for me to want to do everything I can in my being to see that this happens for them. This happens for our future. So um, I just want to explain some of the pictures here. So up in the um, left-hand corner here, I have two students who, uh, those are my advanced students. Um, they're a little older in the class, junior and senior, and what they're doing is now they're teaching. So they're taking this whole Anishinaabe chart and they taught levels one and two, and they filled in that whole chart. And I stepped back and I let them do the whole thing on their own, and they taught all of those. There's tenses in there, there's personal pronouns, they, they, they did that all by themselves. Um, I have other students down here that did that at Petoskey. And then um, the pictures up here are from the lock-in. Uh, last year we had an awesome lock-in at Harbor Springs School. Maybe about 50 youth from all over came there. It was, it, it was wonderful. And um, we had some talking circles there. We had a lot of activities going on. And we were starting to see that energy and that want for they want their community back, their Anishinaabe community back, and they have every right to it. But we need to be there and support them and back them up. So, you know, I think as their right, as their sovereign right to do this, taking back their indigenous education, that's exactly what they want. Um, and then uh, we were playing lacrosse, uh, traditional lacrosse, Bog of the Women, over here, and I thought this is a really cool picture because there's all kinds of students in here. We have um, Wingush, you know, he's like a senior, you know, big guy. And then we have a couple of middle schoolers there. We have uh, uh, female students playing. Um, when females, when girls come to lacrosse, they're kind of intimidated because it's, it's a very um, uh, active sport, you know, a lot of body contact and a lot of movement. But I was really proud of these young girls in here jumping in with all of these bigger boys. We have high schoolers in there. And they're all smiling. I don't know if you can tell, but they were having a blast. They were all smiling. And they just took this conference room over and started playing. It was awesome. You know, it just it couldn't be stopped. It was great. Um, just Because just holding that stick right there, you're connected to the creator. You know, the creator made that game. He lowered that game down to us and that stick. And we play it for the creator. And it, it is a healing game. And um, I remember when our youth, our native youth, kind of took a hit one year. Um, they, were, they were not in the forefront where they should have been. And it made me really sad. And, but there was a lacrosse game going on. And so when I went to that lacrosse game, I, learned, I, I took my shoes off and I sat on the ground and I just watched them play. And it worked, like, I felt better. It was healing me because I felt really bad for our youth that day. Like I was in tears because our leaders kind of let them down. But when I saw them playing that game, it was, it was pretty amazing. So anyway, um, all of this, 
is healing up here. When you hear our children speak the language, it does something to, you, to, to your heart inside when you hear them speak the language. When you see them together and praying, you know, and then when you see them playing bogged away, when it, it all does something to you inside your heart. And that's kind of, you know, that's my motivation. You know, that's why I became a teacher. You know, that's why I became a language teacher is because that's what language did for me. It healed me, you know, and it, it's like I found it and I found my life. I found my purpose. And, you know, I'll do this till, you know, I'm ready to leave in the Western doorway. You know, I'll always do this for you. So, um, yeah, this is, what, this is who we're doing it for. You know, and they will, all of them will be too old for this school. But then they're thinking about their generations after them. And that's what we need to think about now too. So I'm doing it for them. I want them to come back and teach at our school. You know, I want them to come back and teach that Anishinaabe chart. I want the cross coaches there. You know, I want people to know how to pray the same way so they can teach all of our young men how to do that. So that's from our, our youth voice here in the community. I'm just a messenger. We wish. Um, I'm Robin Lees, and um, before I say too much more about myself, I'd like to uh, say miigwech to all of you for being here. It's, uh, it's wonderful to see so many uh, interested people here, people that I've known um, and have a lot of respect for have come tonight. It's uh, so meaningful to the people that have been working on this project. Um, and also want to say we bless you those amazing Anishinaabe Kway that just um, bring so much joy to my heart. Janan and Lucan, the knowledge that you have is joyful to us. And yes, we do talk about some sorrowful things, but the main thing is that is, is looking forward. And uh, that always should bring some joy to our hearts. Um, I taught for 36 years. Um, yeah, most of those years were in the Lakes Indian River. I taught 10 years of Head Start. Um, being a teacher was probably the most wonderful thing that could have happened for me. Um, Michigan uh, and Dodon, so I am a teacher. That's what I'm supposed to be in Turtle Plan, at least that's one of our choices. Uh, what I, I'm going to have to really cut my presentation short. Because what's really important tonight is that you all have a chance to discuss what has been presented as well as some ideas of your own. So, Amanda, if you could go past that. Most of the stuff is logistics, and there you go. Um, I was talking about charter schools, I was talking about funding. You can go past that one. Um, let's see, go back. I want you to go to. Uh, there. Um, I was also acknowledging, and I think I did this last week, what LTVB has already done to enhance um, educational opportunities for our children, and it's a long list. So people haven't been just sitting back doing nothing in regards to uh, educating our children, but these are just some more options that we would like everyone to consider. So this first school is La Cordere's, and they have an emergent school there called Water Kodading, and several people um, from Education and Language Department has, have visited this school. It's a remarkable school. They started out as a charter school to the public school in that area, and um, met their goals as a charter school, and then were, I don't want to say adopted, but they became unified with the tribal school. And uh, they are language immersion. And so they t that's the center, I'd say, of their curriculum. Um, if you would go to, when you get a chance, go to theways.org, and there's a, a great video that is a fine example of how they integrate everything into um, into teaching their children uh, using traditional ways as well as um, colonized methods. So we'll go ahead and change it. All right, this is another school, and um, honestly, Natan knows a little bit more about this than I do, I think. But uh, this school 
the one thing I just want you to notice about it, it is K-12, um, it's fully accredited, it's operated by the tribe, but their school board is not the legislative council. And just want, I just want to point that out. They have a separate board that uh, governs their school. Go ahead. Okay, this school this is kind of my favorite. Uh, and, and there's more out there. We're just beginning to learn about tribal schools across the United States. Um, I'd say besides boarding schools, there have been, to my knowledge, tribal schools going on through the BIA or through the tribes or through federal government of, for the last 40, 50 years, 40 years anyway, as long as I've been teaching and longer. Um, but this one in particular, is a school that started, as you can see, in 2004, and it's not a single tribe. It's a diverse group of students from many different tribes. Albuquerque is a big city, so there are a lot of people living there. Uh, parents and professionals and uh, community members got together because they were dissatisfied with what their, what their children were getting from the public school. So they were careful, they gave a lot of forethought, they took their time and created as the children's needs. Um, I just want to read you, because you need to get into groups, I just would like to read to you what their vision, what their mission is, because um, it's similar to some others that I have, that I've seen. And just think about these things and see if they fit with what your ideas might be. Their mission is to engage students, educators, families, and community in creating a school that will prepare our students to grow from adolescence to adulthood and begin strengthening communities by developing strong leaders who are academically prepared, secure in their identity, and healthy. Um, our vision is of a thriving, and dynamic community where students, educators, families, and Native community leaders come together creating a place for students to grow, become leaders, and prepare to excel in both college and life in general. So they're driven for their children to be um, post-secondary. The Naka community and experience will help students incorporate wellness and healthy life practices, community service, and an appreciation of cultural diversity into their lives. Their goals are, and they have five, five strong goals, build youth to be confident in their cultural identities, encourage youth to persevere academically, support physical, emotional, and spiritual well-being, excuse me, prepare youth academically and emotionally for college, and very often we forget that piece, and it's often why students, when they go on to college, don't get past year one. They're just not emotionally prepared to deal with the challenges there. That's that self-confidence piece, that identity piece. And strengthen youth to take their roles as leaders. There's more about the school that's awesome. Um, I'm not going to talk about the foundation tonight. Um, but if you go to that website, notthschool.org, there's more information about the foundation. They support um, an interest in developing your own tribal school. So it's a two-year commitment with their foundation if you are accepted and you are um, involved with a small group of other professionals, other people interested in educating Native uh, children from their homes. and. Um, <coughs> They give you kind of a, I don't know, a road map and, and helping you um, accomplish the goals of your community. You can go ahead, Amanda. A tribal school is another step towards restoration. We can take responsibility for our cultural survival. Leanne Simpson is a Anishinaabe. She, um, I believe, is from Manitoulin. She has her PhD from Guilford, I believe. Um, she's uh, done a lot of writing. She's a professor in education. She's a poet. She's an amazing woman. What do our children gain from the way our schools 
meaning our curriculum and our teaching practices, are organized. If we do not preserve our tribal cultures and languages, we will lose them even further. Cornell Puerhardy, um, he happens to be a mentor to my daughter, and he's done a lot of research. He's currently a fellow in that fellowship with NAFA. Uh, generations have struggled to learn despite efforts to eliminate our traditions and language. Having a strong sense of yourself and your community is a great foundation for learning. Agnes Chavez is a, a, a retired teacher. She taught 46 years. She's won some national awards, one particular from the NEA, National um, Education Association. She's Lumbee uh, from North Carolina. And uh, she is such a great mentor to a lot of uh, Native teachers. The main goal of the tribal school is to restore the well-being of both the community and the individuals as a foundation for a sustainable future and to revitalize, maintain, and sustain our community in the 21st century and beyond. Gregory Kayati. Um, he is also uh, a PhD in education and he's written a lot of amazing work. Um, one thing that none of these folks had mentioned but that's important, I hope, to many of us is that having our school is practicing our sovereignty. That should be a, a main piece of our, our community and our lives. So, thank you much for all of you coming. In, uh... Thank you much, Robin. All right, we are going to, I know some of you guys are probably really excited to get in the groups, and maybe some of you, some of you guys are not, but um, we're going to do what they call a res cafe, correct? Uh, today I'm in the education department talking about a res cafe. I counted down, it looks like we got about 22 in here. So we need to get into three groups, uh, around seven, maybe one group, have eight. Uh, what we're going to do today is we get you guys in this group. Uh, you've seen in the agenda, there's three questions on the agenda. And we have three stations right here. At each uh, station, you'll see one that's going to be. Is, I'll read the question, raise your hand on what group had that question. And uh, I'll give you the mic, we'll just give a quick little synopsis of what's on the bed and what's happened, what were the thoughts, and then and if anybody in the audience has any thoughts, uh, the real purpose of this is to get some conversation going and to get some input from you guys and get what's written on uh, So we have uh, your guys' thought and your guys' input for this project. So. No, we can, we can move back to our seat. What kind of experiences would you like our children to have in tribal school? Vicki Kelly. Vicki Kelly. Thank you for the lesson. Okay. I will give her the mic. No, I, I don't think you. I think you can all hear me. Okay. okay. So, our. Oh, okay. Our question was, what kind of experiences would you like our children to have in a tribal school? Um, when our group first got together, uh, we let them, I, I did my board a little differently. I let everybody give me their responses and we organized them. Um, so one of the biggest things, one of the things that people wanted to do was to have, to make it uh, multi-general experiences or exchanges. Um, like in a one-room uh, classroom where you have the older kids helping with the younger kids, maybe at reading time or, you know, partners or buddies, you know, older, the older school children helping the younger children, fostering that, that community um, association. Um, let's see, talking circles. Talking circles has been added. That's a really good one. Um, a lot. Sometimes it's hard getting the kids, the youth engaged in a talking circle, but the more that they know that that's a safe place that they can go and that they they are they can say what they want, um, it really helps them to break out of their shells and gives them the opportunity to know that they also have a voice. Um, strong language components, very, very strong language component in a tribal school. Um, technology learning, because the children are gonna to need to stay competitive. Um, as much as we like to keep things, as, you know, as cultural ways as possible, 
we are going to have to embrace some technology um, to keep the kids competitive. Tribal art and literature, world literature, not just American <laughs> literature. There are other um, authors and uh, books that come from places not just uh, West, Eastern Europe, Western Europe, um, Australia, New Zealand. You know, there's other places with indigenous writers. Um, let's see. We want it to, let's see, of course, music and dance. Um, we all learn differently. Music and dance is one of those ways to learn. Um, well-being, uh, holistic, embracing the emotional, the spiritual, the physical, and the mental for a total well-being, not just um, academics, because um, if we don't take care of ourselves, our health, our bodies, we can't go on and serve the next generations. Um, I, I hold on to that one dearly. Um, I want to be old and I want to teach grandchildren. So to get old, I have to take care of myself now. Um, let's see, we want to learn about traditional medicines. Those are still coming. Um, I'm really starting to embrace that a lot more. Um, I think those are, there's some really good stuff there. We're also learning now that the Finnish, um, like we had to learn it from them, the Finnish are embracing the saunas and have been. And the uh, health um, benefits from that are really being um, put out there now. And what is a sauna but a sweat lodge? We've been doing this forever. We already know this. It's good for you. It's not just good for you um, mentally, and it's good for you physically. Um, let's see, we want to we want to learn local history, uh, tribal history, as well as world history. Uh, we want to have experienced native teachers. We want to learn tribal civics. Um, I don't know how many of you know about the clan system, but the clan system was actually developed to give everybody a place and so that they all knew what they needed to do in the way in which it should be done. So everybody had a part and everybody played their part. So this is something that we need to learn and this is some, this, these are all good things. These are all really good things. Um, learning powwow dances, of course that goes with our music and our dancing. One of the big things that came up, and it's on like four different sticky notes here, is for the children to have positive experiences, positive self-esteem, and for them to come home and go, guess what I did today? This was so cool. Um, these are things that the parents want for the children. Um, of course, we have a lot of outside things, traditional lacrosse, outside learning, hunting, fishing, farming. Um, these hands-on activities. I mean, uh, Anishinaabe Mawin is, uh, and a lot of our culture are done orally. So we're not sitting at a table reading and writing. We're out there learning. So that's what the children need to do. Um, and one of the one of the big things. Oh, that's a nice one. Constellation and Anishinaabe star teachings. That was added. Uh, that would be great. I love those kinds of things. I would go to school. Um, let's see. Oh, let's see. Quality versus quantity. Because, you know, we all got numbers. We know they need numbers, but you know how that goes. Um, so anyways, daily ceremonies, because a lot can be learned. Natong gave us that uh, uh, presentation where she said they were, in two weeks they could give us, they could do their own ceremony and repeat the prayers. So that's how you learn daily, daily ceremonies. All right, I think that's pretty much what we got here. Uh, local ecosystems, natural science that we do here. I think, I think that pretty much sums up what we want for tribal school. Creation's paradise. And the creation story. <laughs> Uh, Alright, next question. What kind of experiences are our children having in non-tribal school? I'm very interested in this because this could be positives and negatives. We have a couple pages, so I'll move the cookies and not eat them. Okay, um, they started out uh, prior to when I got here, so I'll try to wrap those up. Uh, lack of confidence and support, feelings of not belonging, no cultural support, low self-esteem, no voice or validation of tribal history, non-experimental, um, exclusive versus inclusive. They don't validate the skill sets the children already have. 
Uh, they don't foster the skill sets that the children have. Uh, they're goal-oriented. Uh, public school curriculum, curriculum contradicts and doesn't support um, our standards and have empathy for community identity. And there's a lot going on with the community you know, everybody's individual, there's not the community identity, community leaders, uh, no cultural identity. There's lots of prejudice and stereotypes. Um, public schools, privilege is one way only. No children of any background, uh, identif identifics, identities of any cultural so otherwise, there are a number of cultures inside of those, or those public schools that are not given, uh, uh, they're, are honored with their identity. Um, not learning tribal civics. They, are, they continue to colonize, experiencing colonization, assimilation. Um, they spoke of the colonized diet, that uh, they're fostering lateral aboriginal violence institutional racism, they're having to lie to pass classes or get passing grades, um, and that has to do with not having the accurate history. Um, athletics are still, those that are quite athletic are still boosted up and supported, where the quiet kids remain invisible. Uh, kindergarten through 12th. What natives contribute, or they're not given credit for what they contribute to society. Um, their history is min minimalized. Um, they said with MEEP and other tests, they are biased. So um, textbooks are created by non-natives. Children are being ostracized if they tell the truth. Tribal children slip through the cracks. They fall behind. Native kids are boxed into certain curriculums. Um, and uh, there was a comment on how to approach or assist kids that are having problems, that they continue or they may use stuff by taking away uh, something more or punishing them and that doesn't work because they don't have a whole lot to begin with. So and that is... Yes. Lots of prejudice and stereotypes. Um, public schools, the privilege um, is one way only. for a tribal school. Uh, longer recesses, hands-on activities, lots of motion, cultural teachings, uh, community circles, use family circles, uh, medicine wheel teachings. Uh, one thing that we brought up was exploring a host family model to create a sense of belonging instead of a boarding school model and trying to get kids inside of schools here. Uh, they were coming from other areas. Students teaching other students fostering uh, cultural identity, increasing self-esteem, lunchtime and meal preparation, traditional foods and harvest done by the kids so that they were learning how to prepare their own foods and learning how to uh, eat a decolonized diet, understanding decolonization strategies, including parents and grandparents doing intergenerational teachings and also bringing in elders and other community members, longer times for learning, um, Fluency in the language, need community support, planning oriented, uh, get more engagement from the community, academic gap resolve and retention, planning sessions with our youth, save uh, culture and history, build a common culture and common experiences, our kids are not getting what they need in public schools the way that they need it, 
Bridging the gap between language, history, and cultural identity. Parent education, school calendar. Was there anything, anything that really sticks out to anybody on those three questions that you guys heard tonight? This one kind of floored me. But yes? I just have a comment, more of a comment, kind of based off of the collaboration that we have. Yeah, here. I'm sorry. Um, the I have, um, I'm Amanda Scarra. I'm the Title VI tutor mentor. Um, for Inland Lakes and Wolverine schools. And at Inland Lakes, I have two students that actually came from the, the Sioux, and they actually went to a tribal school. And I'm using this as an example as children that come from tribal schools versus kids that come from non-tribal schools. Um, when they came, they were super confident. confident. They had um, a gleam in their eye, if you will. And they, when they found out that I, we kind of talked about language, they immediately said, yes, I know. And they would, and so every time they see me in the hallway, they're like, Ani, Ani. And so we kind of, and so, but slowly, that gleam is going out of their eye. So this is an example. I do believe that it is necessary for you to have a tribal school if you're going to keep growing and nurturing your tribal children. Um, they need to know because unfortunately uh, public schools do have a way, even with my own children and the cultures that I teach in my home, they don't have that at their school, you know? And I'm seeing more and more why parents are choosing to homeschool or send them to schools that have very similar beliefs to them. Because it is a core part of the human species. Like we need culture, we need that, um, and just common ground with one another, that community. And so that's just an example, um, especially the older uh, student, he is in middle school right now, uh, he is losing his way because when you are going through that puberty time, when you don't have that, that pulling and saying, hey, this is who you are and we believe in you and this, you're a man now. As he doesn't feel that, he's losing his way. And so it is really important um, to have that, so that was just my input of the confidence where I definitely see that. So. I just, just real quick, that was great. Um, both of my children came from an emergent school in Wisconsin, with Dottie, and that gleam, yeah, that went away. Um, but we try our hardest as a family to keep that, and I know um, without their culture and, and their identity, um, they would they would be lost if they didn't have their family who um, offered that, like that being an Anishinaabe is a natural daily part of their lives. And the only reason why they're in public school is because of lacrosse. That's what is getting my son through high school. He hates high school, he does. But he knows that it's gonna go by fast and he just wants to get good grades because he's got goals with lacrosse. That's the only thing. Um, he, he, he's, his culture is not respected. You know, he's not accepted there. Um, he's, he doesn't relate to a lot of the other kids there. You know, and um, he's excluded. But the only thing that keeps him there is, is lacrosse, and he knows that that's his cultural tie also. So that's what keeps him going. Um, but when you said about that gleam, you know, I totally connected to that right away because I've seen that, you know, with my own children. And then I know that that Phil is um, is pretty like shocked about the the question up here. And you know, sorry to to say, but that is reality. And I'm you know I'm in a public school daily, and that that is reality right there. Um, both of my children have gone through uh, racial bullying, where they they've been bullied because they're in Anishinaabe and. You know, they've been called spear chucker, they've been called whatever name you can think of. And they also are singled out because they're um, against the mascot. They're against the, the Northwind mascot. And the thing is, is that their um, biggest uh, push is other Native kids because other Native kids see that as culture, that, that mascot. And 
that that's not <laughs> that's not culture, you know. And I know that's a huge like discussion, and then you know, and it's a community wide issue, but that that's forced upon them. You know, my son does wear eagle feathers. He's not a mascot. So why is the school celebrating that? So you're telling him directly that, you know what, you don't matter. We just want your image. We don't care about history. We don't care about your language. We don't care about anything. We just want that image. That's what that tells him. So why would he want to learn? Why do you think he would feel accepted in that classroom? So that, yeah, it's a reality. The public school does not support us. And I'm there. Not because they invited me to be there. I don't get paid by the school district. I'm there because of this community. We push that in the school. Because the language department and because of ZBED law, because of our, our language teacher that passed away, they wanted it in the schools. Our children wanted it, not the public school. We were not invited up there. I don't get paid by the public school. So they are, no, they're not welcoming. They are not let's embrace our local culture, our local native people. No, that doesn't, that doesn't happen. Our kids don't feel that. So, I'm sorry, I just had to say that. Is there anything else? All right, Janan. My name is Janan. Uh, when this young lady, when she was in school, um, and her um, schoolmates used to call our house and they would ask for Janan. Well, um, I told them, uh, I said, which one? They said, oh, the little one. I'm like, well, what does that mean? <laughs> so, then, so then they said, oh, the younger one. And I was like, well, that doesn't sound any better. <laughs> but she said, mom, don't do that. They don't know you're joking. But anyways, I just said, <laughs> <laughs> Anyways, um, what I noticed about this experience is that um, as, Anishinaabe, as Anishinaabe people, a lot of things that get stored in our long-term memory are as experiential. The things that we experience are things that we retain. And a lot of these things, the culture, the all that, it has to do with our experience. And like one of the worst things that you can do to a native person is to banish them. Us being connected to our community is like everything. You know, we go to a, a function or whatever. It's like, hey, you know, are you going? And you know, we gotta have food or our go suppers. And part of our repatriation, our, I mean our reaffirmation and probably our repatriation too is because of the experiences that we had as a native community connects us. So, and it's really important that the tribal school is community driven because that, that our kids are watching, they're listening. They're like, they obviously care by that presentation because they said, hey, we want to come back and we want to contribute. So it's really important that this is grassroots kind of community driven and not to be something the tribal council does, you know? But I mean, everything that, that I've done here has been, I've had experiences and that's how I'm like connected. It's really, really important that as Anishinaabe people that we're connected with somebody else in our community, either through family ties or, you know, somebody that works in that department or you went fishing with somebody, you know, those types of things. That's what, that's how, that's how I feel after hearing all of this input and everything. Thank you much. Oh. Anyone else? No one else, I'll hand over the one to Janine. Thank you guys very much. Thank you, Phil, for helping facilitate that. Um, take that Tell me what to do. Good job. Um, I, I, I want to share one thing that I noticed that really stood out to me was that question back there, what sort of need exists? I think that people just jumped straight into a discussion about what a tribal school would look like and what it should do and what the experiences should be and didn't even talk about, well, do we need one? So to me, that was something that really stood out about tonight. Um, but then again, the people that would show up to this kind of meeting, as Denise pointed out, of course they're going to say, yeah, we need a tribal school. So um, I really appreciate each and every one of you coming here tonight. Um, you know, there are some of you that I don't see often, and um, it's really great to 
um, see you here. It tells me that you really, really care. And I especially appreciate the folks who came who work with our tribal students on a daily basis and um, are able to share what they know and what they see about what's happening in the school and on the ground level because, you know, they're on the front lines. So um, I want to say, Chiniwech, especially for your, your input and your thoughts. Not that anyone else's input and thoughts is important, but I think that that's a, a completely different perspective that we need. Um, and I hope to do this kind of thing more with the young people, with the students, because it's really about um, in, in my view, a best practice is to design learning that's interest-based and, and driven by the students themselves. So um, I, I hope to um, do that and hopefully we can continue these conversations digitally as well because, you know, as we all know, the majority of our tribal citizens do not live in the Tri-County area. The majority of them are living outside of this area and to me, they count just as much, if not more, because their numbers are bigger um, as part of this community and their voice and their opinion counts. So we're hoping to, you know, kind of continue these conversations both here and digitally and allow for that input and, you know, try to be as democratic as possible, possible about this process and, you know, really, um, you know, trying to be community-driven and community-based and how we move forward and make decisions about this. Um, so I wanted to say just Thank you all again for coming, Chi Miigwech, Kibajayek, um, for all your amazing input. We're definitely going to take this. We're going to save this. Um, I have papers from our tribal, not tribal, our early childhood meetings four years, five years ago. So, you know, they're in my office rolled up. We're definitely going to keep these. We're going to synthesize the information and we're going to use this to move forward. Um, our next set of meetings are going to be in February. We're going to continue to build off these conversations. They're going to be become more focused. And, you know, I know a lot of you have questions about things like funding. So we can, you know, start talking about possibilities for things like that. And, you know, I know there are other concerns as well, like transportation. How are we going to get kids from across, you know, three counties to one central place in a timely, efficient manner? So we'll, we'll have those conversations. So please join us in February. There are flyers on the table there with the dates. I don't know them off the top of my head, but um, we hope to see you. So thank you so much for coming. Much.